Self-awareness is one of the biggest enemies to creativity. Self-awareness is something that we actually actively avoid. Because we are four creative people, four writers, there was no way that we were ever going to be satiated doing the same thing over and again. Change was inevitable for us, and a very natural thing. I don't know many artists who've managed to go a career without bringing these things up, saying the word God, Jesus, it happens in a million rock songs. We have this spirit that's just uncrushable. If you told me in the 90s that I'd be in a chart battle with Green Day, I probably would have just laughed at you. I've always thought of faith as an acknowledgement of not being the biggest thing in the universe. When we made the first album, it was meant to be a snapshot of Mumford Sons in 2009. We're not the first band who went to public school. When you write on the road, you are restricted to the instruments around you, whereas in the studio, you can plug anything in and try it. I was a bass guitarist first before I started playing double bass, and I only started playing it because my teacher said I'd get twice as much work as there's not enough players out there. We never thought we'd be commercially viable, and we were proved wrong. A lot of the time, if you go into an arena, they're pretty uninspiring, but we try to create an atmosphere. We don't want to be as big as Oasis. We'd never thought we'd get to travel so extensively, meet our heroes, and collaborate with so many people. We've always imagined ourselves as a rock band. We've always been a rock band playing the wrong instruments. We wouldn't last a year on the road playing music that we didn't love. We're obviously a London band, and British at heart. We don't sing about eating local produce or growing beards or anything like that. It's funny to find yourself in a position where people associate you with things that are completely arbitrary to your songs. You can't just repeat. It's valueless. So we were really keen to challenge ourselves. I suppose a byproduct of that will be challenging our fans a bit as well. Touring is something I do really well. Can't cook. Can't, I dunno, do paperwork. I don't know, what else can't we do? I'm not to be trusted with other people's animals. We were thrilled when we were nominated for Best New Artist at the Grammys, but we were even more so when they asked us to play live. It's strange to think about the scathing reviews Sig no more got and then consider that we could win Best Album a year or so later. We really believe in our music. And it's still heartening to know that it's appreciated, and that's what sticks. We always try to make each record a snapshot of the band at that time. People don't really need to question our sincerity when it comes to our songs. You look at the instrumentation, and you can't really argue that we set out with commercial aspirations. Banjos and things like that are not part of some formula for global success. But it felt right, and I think there's some value to purity of intention. You can't really opt into something you don't believe in. 90% of the time, 
I'm sitting in a bus driving through some place like the Colorado mountains and thinking, well, we're not in a pub in London anymore. Whether people jump up and down when they see us or are completely quiet, it just feels really good that they're connecting. In December 2010, we embarked on a slightly strange tour of India. We played every kind of gig you could imagine over two weeks, from sports bars to hotel bars to a beautiful outdoor amphitheater. There's definitely a negative correlation between the higher the profile and the enjoyment of the gig. It's impossible to tell how you're perceived. I think it's important not to think about it too much because it really means nothing. Some people think we're a rock band, and that's ridiculous. And the idea of us being a folk band, you sit in a pub in Ireland and hear those guys play, and you're like, yeah, we're definitely not a folk band. Our spiritual home is definitely the UK, but we have such a breadth of influence and America's a huge part of that, as I think it is for most bands. None of us had really any interest in doing a sort of babble too. Being a bass player in a band without a drummer for seven, eight years has been kind of weird. We kind of are Okies at heart. I don't really know what an Okie is, but I feel like one. There's a point with every record we've made that the album starts to assert its identity, and I think that's kind of what happened with The Wolf. We were proud of our first two records, but the parameters were pretty narrow. We didn't have full drums, for example. There were just so many limitations to that setup and we really fully explored them. Sticking to our guns, creatively, is the only way we'll ever survive as a band, and be happy. We don't make music except for the joy of making music, really, and meeting people and sharing ideas. We're a restless bunch, and we have a lot of energy we're never going to stand still. We never could have foreseen the success of Babel. It's not like banjo records were soaring up the charts, you know. As soon as we started playing sports arenas, we thought how great it would be if we could instead play to 25,000 people in our own way, a way we can control it so there's not all kinds of company, branding around the show, and do it in a way that celebrates the community. Most people overcome something terrible at some point in their lives. You leave school, work terrible jobs to pay rent, and that's when you start finding your way in music and forming bands. We started off as Marcus Mumford, which is our singer's name, but then it very quickly became apparent it wasn't really a one-man thing. It was indeed a band. We wanted to give the impression of a family business, and we just liked the ring of Mumford Sons. Without a drummer, You've got that sort of running, chicken chasing, rhythmic thing happening with the banjo in the top end. It's what gives our music a lot of its momentum, a lot of its energy. We have big limitations by not having a drummer. It instantly informs a lot of our musical decisions when it comes to writing. What we end up coming out with is not very cerebral music. We don't read a lot of what people say about us. There's not a lot to hide behind when you make the sort of music we make. 
I play the drums really, really badly. I think it's a great story, the story of Babel. I think anyone can direct it as an analogy for a lot of different situations. As humans, we're such a discontented species. We're always trying to further ourselves, and you get all the way to the moon, and then it's just discontent. You want to go to Mars. <laughs>